Well, hello and welcome to Explore Classroom. My name is Celeste Harrison and I'm so excited to have you joining us today. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change the world for the better. This Explore Classroom YouTube show connects students all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and time for all of your student questions. Today, our explorer is Maddie Rodrigue. Maddie has traveled the globe studying some of the most remote and least explored areas of our ocean, including the Red Sea and the Arctic Ocean. She serves as the science program lead for OceanX, which means that Maddie is responsible for building science programming and developing relationships with research and science partners and figuring out the best ways to use all of the really cool gear and expertise on board a great big ocean research ship called the Ocean Explorer. The goal is always to do the most innovative and groundbreaking science possible and to share it with the world. I can't wait to hear more about this very exciting and unusual job, learn new parts of the ocean and get to hear more of Maddie's story. But before we get into that, let's do some shout outs. So the shout outs for this episode are going to the Avondanos, the Braymare family, the Clareville Public School System, Don Tyson School of Innovation, Maya, Jack, Joseph A. Leonard Middle School, the Miller family, Miss Smith, Miss F's class, Miss G students, PS274 Kiskio, Shabam, Timothy Ball Elementary, the Tran family, Javier Machado, the Yanas group, and Adele. As a quick reminder here at the top, like many students in the Northern Hemisphere, Explorer Classroom is about to go on our winter break. We have one more week of events before that happens, and we'll see you guys again in 2022 after the holidays. With all that talking from me out of the way, let's get this Explorer Classroom started. It's time for me to turn it over to Maddie, get a screen share going and learn all about exploring the ocean. Take it away. Amazing, thank you, Celeste. Hi everybody, I'm Maddie Rodrigue. I am the science program lead for an organization called Ocean X. Ocean X is a nonprofit ocean science and exploration and media initiative designed and developed to explore the world's oceans using cutting edge technology, groundbreaking science, and bringing our discoveries with media back to the world. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what OceanX does and what I do on the ship, Ocean Explorer, and also with Hi the Hi everybody, program. I'm Maddie Rodrigue. I am the science at OceanX. <laughs> and, and also will, um, but first I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got started, how I became a marine biologist, and how I ended up in this fabulous, amazing job that I am so lucky to do. Um, I'm actually at home right now in Chandler, Arizona at my parents' house. I haven't been home in about two years because of the whole traveling the world on the ship thing, and also because of the global pandemic, which is unfortunate, but I'm so lucky to be home right now with my parents. So you might see some embarrassing photos, actually, I think on the very next slide. So <laughs> as I said, I had access to some photos of me when I was a young kid being at home with my family today. Um, so I, as I said, grew up in Chandler, Arizona. And for those of you that are, I need a little refresher on where that is. Um, I drew a little red box here on the map. Um, Arizona is a Southwestern state in the United States. And um, weirdly, as you might see on the screen, there's no ocean bordering any part of Arizona. So it's a completely landlocked state and it's a desert. So that means that I grew up without really any immediate access to the ocean. But I knew um, when I wasn't a being a Disney princess with my sister and friend that I wanted to be a scientist. And so I spent a lot of time running around my backyard with my parents, looking at lizards and rocks and really interesting bugs. I got my first toy microscope when I was about six. I knew I wanted to do something called science, but I didn't really know what that meant. Um, as I was growing up, I was lucky enough to travel around with an organization called Jump Rope for Heart and go to different schools and talk to students and talk to them about how to stay healthy, how to stay fit, all while being a competitive jump roper, traveling the world, doing amazing competitions. Yes, it is a thing. Look it up. There's some amazing videos of people and athletes in this world that do some incredible tricks. But really what that did was get me really comfortable talking with classrooms and students. And so I knew at a very young age, I wanted to be doing something that was bringing communication about important topics back to the public and I was really passionate about science. You can see that picture of me in the little boots um, on the far corner. 
Um, my dad grew up in Seattle, so luckily we were able to go visit that side of the family for summer holidays. Um, and I got a little bit of access to the ocean. That's me digging for clams on the beach. <laughs> um, and I, so I, I became really enraptured with the ocean at a very young age. But at that point in time, I didn't really know what a marine biologist was. So when I was in sixth grade, so about 11 years old, I actually got to go on a class field trip to San Diego and to the Los Angeles area. And that allowed me to actually meet a marine biologist for the first time at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Um, I got to go on a little research boat with a graduate student who was doing their work um, at the time and doing some communication and outreach to classrooms just like you guys. And they put a little net uh, down off the back of the boat. They dragged up a bunch of little critters, sea stars, sea cucumbers, a lot of mud. And I remember that moment so clearly. I was standing on the back of that boat all of my classmates were getting so seasick around me. I have still never been seasick, so that's amazing. Um, and I looked at those sea cucumbers and those sea stars and I said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. But how do I do that? I didn't, I had no idea how. So Celeste, if you go to the next slide, please. So I got my um, high school education as well in Arizona, and then I went to undergraduate um, a college called Arizona State University, where I majored in biological sciences with a concentration in conservation and ecology. And I really wanted to get out and get some hands-on work in science and in the field. So that's called field work. And so when I when I wanted to do field work, I wanted to get a sense of how um, I could study the environment around me and the animals that lived in the environment around me, um, and really understand the systems and the processes that allowed them to thrive in such an unforgiving place, not unlike the deep sea, as I later found out in life. Um, so the desert obviously is very little water, but all of the animals there have adopted really unique mechanisms for survival. So I was studying things that look a lot different than what I study today. Um, for example, there's a little mouse um, up there that I would go out and I would trap a bunch of them and measure them and then release them back into the wild so we could get an assessment of their population. Um, the picture of me and those bigger muck boots this time than when I was a little kid um, were from where I was wading out into the middle of these pools that temporarily fill up with water um, when I'm in the middle of the desert. Um, when we get rain, it's really precious. And so these little pools fill up with water and then we would go out and we would measure the, the bugs that started living in that water. And then we would put up big nets and trap these bats, which you see on the far corner there. Um, and we would measure the bats as well. And we would assess their health as well. And actually at one point I did get stuck in the mud in those waders um, and the uh, parks and recreation people that I was working with told me that they were very glad they were on site to pull me out because they set up trail cams at that very pool and they would see mountain lions come down to that pool every single night. So it's a very good thing I was able to get out of that pool. Um, but obviously I got to see some amazing views in the desert as I was um, in undergraduate, um, in my undergraduate college education, as you can see there by the photo. I'm very lucky to have been um, able to given the opportunity to grow up in this amazing and very extreme environment. Um, but again, I still, everything I was doing in college, I still was working towards becoming a marine scientist and marine biologist. And so there, um, my journey took me to all the way to Maine, where I had never been before um, for a graduate school program at the University of Maine. So at the University of Maine, I was studying marine biology and marine policy. Specifically, I was looking at fisheries. So all of the fish species that live up there on the northern east coast in what's called the Gulf of Maine, I was understanding their populations the same as I was doing with those little mice and the bats, but this time with fish. Um, so I was going out every single day working with salty fishermen like you see there in the picture. Those are two captains I got to work with as part of the, the research program. And I was running this program um, that was looking at the health of fish populations. And so I would go out every morning on boats and I would set gear and I would bring fish up and I would measure them and I would weigh them and I'd put them back. And we would learn all sorts of things about the health of the population, especially in that area, which is hit, being hit really hard by climate change and warming. And so all of the species up there, the way that they move around, the patterns of distribution, the health of the populations are all changing because everything in the environment is changing so fast up there. So as you can see on the bottom right hand corner, um, the boats that I used to sail on every single day, uh, we would leave about uh, 4 a.m. out of different ports all over the coast of Maine. Um, and I thought those boats were pretty big because at that point I had never actually been 
consistently on a boat. I had gone, you know, that one time when I was a kid. And then I also went sailing a couple of times with some friends. But other than that, I'd never spent any significant time at sea. And so, of course, as soon as I moved to Maine, they said, we're going to stick you on a boat working with fishermen for days at a time. And you're just going to be there. And that's what you're doing for the next four years. And I said, OK, sign me up. So. I would go out on these boats and I would use this gear and you can kind of see that board there in the corner and a, 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 get an orange tote and then a toolbox full of tools. And I thought I was so cool. I had all these tools and I could measure all these fish. And I thought that was just the cutting edge in technology because even when I was in my graduate program, I was still very much learning about what being a marine scientist, a marine bio biologist actually was, and all of the opportunities available to me in that space. So I spent four years in Maine, and then I ended up taking a fellowship program with um, an organization called Sea Grant, which basically um, helps communities understand their natural ocean resources. They help communities um, take on different challenges like coastal resilience. So as the climate changes and sea level starts rising, how do communities build and adapt to those changes? Um, they're a very, very wonderful program. And, and I got a fellowship with them um, to go on to the big world of the US government, uh, working for a government agency called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Next slide, please. So that's NOAA for short. I'm just going to refer to it as NOAA from here on out. And while I was with NOAA, I traded in my fishing boots and my fishing gear for a blazer, <laughs> a suit, <laughs> which is a very big change of pace for me. As you can see, there are no um, waders or muck boots pictured here. I was traveling all over the world speaking on behalf of U.S. ocean weather and climate policy. And I was talking to all of these governmental organizations, such as uh, the, on the floor of the UN with UNESCO, or also with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, which is responsible for our global shared understanding of how the oceans, weather patterns, and long-term climate is changing and developing strategies with different countries to understand how we can keep building science, how we can do research and work together to make sure that we're all in this together and we all understand what we need to do in the future in order to um, come up with some of these solutions around how quickly things are changing. While I was at NOAA, I also got a lot of cool opportunities to do that thing I love, which is speaking and science communication. So I was at the American Museum of Natural History, as you can see up there um, in my handy dandy fish pattern shirt, um, where I was able to work with a bunch of students and, and um, have a session where we were doing fish passage and looking at how many fish can travel through a restored river area um, in a given time versus when there's a dam. Um, in the river. And then I also got the opportunity to sail on my very first oceanographic research vessel. So big, big ship that's capable of going all over the world. And that was called the Ronald H. Brown. And that's the ship that you see pictured below. And that's really where I fell in love with, with targeted oceanography, with seagoing, with being at sea for long periods of time, and um, with ocean exploration and working with ship teams on board. Um, actually, a funny story about when I was on the Ron Brown, um, I was going there on behalf of headquarters. And so, you know, everybody that works on the boat thinks that everybody at the big government agency is going to show up in a suit. And I showed up, um, obviously, in a very low key clothing. And I um, immediately asked if there's anything I can do to help the crew with the daily operations on the vessel. So they put me to work right away. Um, I started um, using a sand blaster to work on the deck. I was using, I was rest busting. I was learning all of the drills. I was doing um, really cool, um, helping with really cool operations on um, the back deck of the vessel. And also um, I, they did have me clean the bilge <laughs> on a Sunday morning, um, which I actually really enjoyed because I got to work with the engineering team directly. Um, and then of course, after that, they let me drive the ship as you can see down there. And what you don't see in that photo is the look of absolute horror on the captain's face in the background <laughs> as I'm driving the ship in open waters. That trip also gave me the opportunity to go through the Panama Canal for the first time ever. And actually, since I've done um, that trip, I've been in the um, both the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal. So both canals, which in seafarers terms means I have my order of the ditch, which is a classification I get when you go through both canals. Next slide, please. So this is what my office looks like these days. As I said, I am the science lead for OceanX. So what does that mean? That means I get to work with amazing teams on board, scientists all over the world to develop projects and programs that utilize fully ocean explorers, 
unique capabilities as a research platform. This is the Ocean Explorer. Um, as you can see, it's kind of a Swiss army knife. We have a whole bunch of tools that allow us to go all over the world. So for example, this in the last year of operation on Ocean Explorer, I was, I was in Norway, I went to the Red Sea, I was in uh, the Bahamas, the Dominican Republic, the Azores, then I went up to the Arctic, all the way up to the North Pole. Um, and I uh, was in Svalbard and we went all the way up to where the, the sea ice starts forming at that North, the northernmost latitude in the world. I was in the northernmost town in the world and we're going to go back to the Red Sea again. So we go all over the world with this vessel. We work with local groups to do science and to take on really cool initiatives and projects to build local capacity in the work that they're already doing. But then we also take on science projects for ourselves as well. So what can this ship actually do? So let's next slide, please. So Ocean Explorer is 285 feet long. It's a floating research and media platform. So like I said in, in my intro, everything that we do, we like to bring it back to the world. So that's on social media, that's on uh, in TV shows, that's in movies, that's in everything that we can possibly think of to make sure that we're getting the public engaged and involved in the ocean space. Um, we have two 1,000 meters, so about 3,300 feet capable of diving submersibles on board. So that's three people that get into the subs and they can go all the way down to over 3000 feet deep in the ocean to look at really amazing deep sea life, to make scientific collections. So take rocks and coral and fish and bring them back up and study them. And then also of course, um, a whole suite of amazing cameras on board to document and capture it all. We have four laboratories on board and I am responsible for all of them. <laughs> um, we have three dry laboratories on board. So we do imaging, we do micro so you can see me looking in that microscope in that top photo. Um, we can project images from the microscope up on the screen so everybody can see what the scientist is looking at. Um, we have a full genetic sequencing lab on board that allows us to take an animal from the depth from the animal the, the subs or from the asset that I'll tell you about next, the ROV, bring it up to the surface put it into um, the wet laboratory, which is um, one of our labs on board that allows us to take all samples, um, put them in tanks and aquarium and study them. Um, we can take a sample from there. We can bring it up to the dry lab. Um, we can look at it under the microscope and then we can extract its DNA and sequence um, some parts of, it, of the, that animal. So we can check to see what species we actually found. We can take DNA out of water and we can look at what DNA is in that water, like kind of like forensics where you look and see what DNA is around. And we can say, okay, well, this animal was here in the last couple of weeks. Like, can we look around more for this animal and hope to see it with our amazing cameras? Um, we have uh, two now deep sea ROVs. So we actually have a big ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, which goes under the water down to over 18,000 feet. So that's more than 95% of the total ocean that it can explore because that last 5% is the very, very deepest part that very few ships and submersibles can get to. So we can pretty much sample all the way from the surface down to 95% of the whole ocean we can look at with our cameras and our science equipment. We also have a smaller ROV that flies out of the big ROV. So think Russia doll situation and that small ROV we can put into hydrothermal vents and underwater volcanoes, or we can film the big ROV from the little ROV. And it's essentially the cutest thing ever is my favorite tool on board. Um, we can also drive that um, in shallow water from some of our onboard um, small boats that live on our big boat. We have a six, uh, Remus 6000 AUV, which is basically a robot that we can program to drive around in really deep water and map and take video and collect samples while we can be off doing other things. And then it comes up and it pings us on the satellite and we go get it and we bring it back on board and we take all the data off of it and then we program it again, let it go and um, do it all again the next day. Um, the onboard helicopter we have is really great. I love flying in helicopters, as it turns out, which I had never done before joining OceanX. And um, I love getting up there and looking for marine mammals and looking at amazing scenery and looking for, um, sometimes we look for, um, you know, bits of ocean debris and we mark those and we uh, let the pilots know on the boat so we know where it is so we can go collect it. And then we can also map entire ecosystems with sound. So we have all of these so what are called sonars on the boat that basically let us look at 3D maps of the seafloor, most of which is unknown right now to the, the uh, human population. We can look at 3D maps of the seafloor. We can look at everything that lives in the water column. Um, and then we can look at what's going on in the surface. So we can go to an area that no one knows anything about, really remote part of the world, and essentially learn as much as possible with all these amazing tools um, and, and know enough to be able to help 
local countries and local scientists promote their own um, protection, conservation, and future work in the area. Um, so what does all of this actually mean? So I'm going to show you guys a little bit um, of a video here, and I hope you like it. And this is a really cool discovery that we made when we were in the Red Sea last year. Um, and we're going to stop the video um, about a quarter of the way through, but you can find this video at oceanx.org or on YouTube um, and we and to watch the full thing. It's about nine minutes long. But um, what I really want you to take away is how we use all these tools in action and, and what we do and, and why we can use all these tools to find the truly amazing things that, that we can and how lucky we are to be able to do that. So go ahead, Celeste, thanks. So a survey technician came and found me and she said, I think I found something. It looked like this little tiny anomaly in the map. So it was sort of like this smooth, 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 and then all of a sudden there was a little bump. I'm Maddie Rodrigue, the science program lead for OceanX. So we were asked to conduct an ecosystem survey of the Neom region of the Northern Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba to explore and characterize a completely unexplored area. So the lead up to the Red Sea was actually kind of crazy because it was our first ever scientific expedition on board Ocean Explorer. I think the mood on board was excited and a little bit nervous because everything that we were gonna be doing in this region was gonna be brand new to science. Hey Colleen. Hello. What are you doing? We are mapping, finally. Every night, our survey technician was doing what we call mowing the lawn. So she would create a line plan, and the ship would follow that track to create a 3D image of what that seafloor was. So we are just really getting everything sort of dialed in and uh, running all of the sonars at the same time and going to collect some data so that the science folks can pick out an interesting dive site for tomorrow. So it was about week two in the expedition. We woke up in the morning and the survey technician um, came and found me and she said, here we are, we're in the northern part of the Gulf of Aqaba and I think I found something. And it looked like this little tiny bump. But that bump was about 100 meters long <laughs> and about 20, 30 meters tall. And she said, I think this might be a shipwreck. So then, of course, we all go into a frenzy. The entire plan of the day completely changed, and we decided, okay, we're gonna go down and see if this is a wreck or if it's just a rock. So we decided to, to send the ROV down, and there, at around 850 meters, a massive shipwreck. forget what happened next for as long as I live. All of a sudden, as we're looking at the bow of the shipwreck, this massive creature comes into view, takes a look at the ROV and curls its entire body around the bow of the wreck. <laughs> well, I was frozen in absolute shock, and our ROV team was frozen in absolute shock, and our sub team was frozen in absolute shock. And before we all started yelling, our data system luckily captured a frame grab of the exact moment that that animal moved past us, and the videos were rolling and recording the entire time. The fins, fins right up on the top. Yeah. Most most squid have them coming much further down. Yeah. Now we don't know what species it was. There are several species of squid that are larger than human beings. Uh, we're still trying to determine what that is. We're consulting with experts. We're trying to understand how we could confirm the identity of this species. That is... Amazing. So that was probably one of the coolest days of my life. I'm really glad we got to share that with you guys. Um, I cannot even begin to describe the mood on board. Uh, when that occurred, it was like, <laughs> I joke, it was a made for TV moment, giant shipwreck, massive animal, huge, cool mystery um, for the next couple of months, actually trying to figure out what that species was. 
And one really important thing um, to note about all of that is <clears throat> when we don't know what an animal is right away, it takes a lot of time and thought and consulting with experts and a lot of different techniques to figure out what the species was. So immediately we got all excited and we we're like, wow, that's a squid that was definitely larger than a human being. I wonder if it was the giant squid. But then of course we start looking into it, doing more work. The Wi-Fi on board isn't that good. So we open books <laughs> and we say, okay, well, there are more than 11 species of squid that actually get to be larger than human beings. So what are the important questions that we can ask to narrow it down? And so we said, okay, where does it live? So there we were in the Red Sea. So we started looking at all of the species of squid that live or have been documented in the Red Sea. Turns out there are quite a few. <laughs> then we started looking at animals that could get to be that size, but it's really hard to estimate the size from the ROV because of all the cameras and because of the way that um, they're positioned on the ROV and themselves. So we tried to compare it against the known size of the wreck. Finally, we decided we were gonna call in the big guns. So we called in um, our squid expert, um, Dr. Mike Vecchioni over at the Smithsonian. <clears throat> and he has identified you know, so many species and he is definitely considered one of the leading squid experts in the world. And he confirmed for us based on then the third most important thing we were looking at, the movement and the behavior of the animal, which is something very important when you're looking at identifying species. He looked at the movement, the behavior, the habitat, so where it lived, and then uh, the depth at which we found it. And then also cross-referenced that with all of the other known species of squid to be in the Red Sea and told us that it was called the purple back flying squid which we just loved. So purple back flying squid, but he told us the really interesting thing was that this was the purple back flying squid as it existed in giant form. So we knew it was pretty big, but it was cool. We didn't find the giant squid, but it was a giant squid, the purple back flying squid in giant form in the Red Sea. So this is just one example of some of the amazing discoveries that we've gotten to make and that I've gotten to be there for as I sail around the world on Ocean Explorer. Um, I'm so excited to uh, be here today to answer any and all questions you might have. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, I will open it up for questions. Well, for your last question, Maddie, how can young people out there help protect and explore the ocean? Oh, amazing question. I think, um, you know, anybody can protect and explore the ocean. You just have to be interested. You have to be curious. You have to ask questions, stay involved. Um, you know, getting involved with National Geographic is obviously a great way to do that. Um, following along their content, getting involved with Ocean X, following our content, looking for internship opportunities, asking your teachers, your parents um, for different ways to um, get engaged with citizen science initiatives. Um, I think, you know, you guys are the most important generation for our future. I think you guys are, are gonna make a really big impact on this world. And, and I think it's gonna be a really positive impact. And, and so the more engaged with the ocean world, whatever that looks like, even if it's just, you know, um, looking at ocean videos, even if it's just thinking about the ocean when you make decisions or when you make purchases, thinking about your imp impact on the world around you, I think that's the best, start that you can do. For anybody that's interested in getting involved in marine science or marine biology, just know that there's not one path. There's no one right answer. Um, you can take a whole bunch of different paths. The world of marine biology or marine science, ocean science, exploration um, can look like a whole bunch of different things. Engineering, social, social media, communication, science, um, even coming on board and working as one of the ship's crew. So those pathways can be a, a lot of different um, versions. And as long as you're tenacious and you ask questions and you you sort of stick stick with learning as much as you can about the space and, and being active and caring about it, talking to each other, talking to um, scientists, talking to uh, people that work in the space, you can always reach out to Ocean X um, about how to get more involved. Um, you'll always find opportunities and be able to grow in, in, um, in your careers and in your own interest and involvement with the ocean. Well, huge thank you, Maddie, for doing this amazing work and also for hanging out with us to share it. Thank you to the teachers and parents out there who make cool stuff like this happen for your kids. And thank you most of all to the students for sending your very, very awesome questions. We appreciate them. They're very inspiring. And I hope to see you all at more of our events. Next week, we join archaeologist and biological anthropologist Canelo Malopeani. You can register your student group for a shout out during the event and a chance to be up here on screen at natgeoed.org slash explore classroom. Like I said at the beginning, we are getting really close to our winter break. Our last events for 2021 are next week, the 16th, and we pick back up in the middle of January. Have an awesome day. Stay curious, keep exploring, and we'll see you back.